Okay, I've been given my cue. I'm told also that we're live streaming, so uh, welcome to those who are on the live stream. I'm also meant, I'm asked to warn you, uh, well, yes, make sure your phone doesn't go bleepity bloop. Um, also that, uh, I mean, we're pretty casual and fine to have uh, beverages in here, but if you uh, stand up and walk around, you may be standing right, you know, might be blocking the, uh, the live stream. So be careful about, uh, about doing that. So those were just a few things that I was asked to mention. Um, now I think the miracle of technology will bring, bring us to some other slides, right? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So, um, well, this this is my slide. So, uh, well, sorry, we don't have Michael Faraday here today, but, uh, well, something in that spirit, though. Um, you know, something for all. Uh, this uh, I always like this picture is from the 1840s, I believe, at the British Institute, and this is Faraday lecturing on, I'm not actually sure what, maybe optical glasses or something? I look at Reiner Wasser, and he probably knows something about this. No. No? Okay. Um and uh, I always think this is a very, very interesting that this is a very uh, good uh, gender equality, actually, in, uh, in the year 1840, that uh, there were uh, people of all ages and genders uh, uh, at his lectures. <clears throat> I, well, we'll see if we can come up to that. I, I surely won't. Uh, so, but uh, I'm just here to say a few opening words. Um, in, in lieu of our board of directors who were hoping to be at this uh, event but were not able to come, so I'm, I'm the sort of pretend uh, 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 president of a board for these few minutes. Um, so uh, we indeed come to the end of the summer, although the um, temperature doesn't really indicate that. Um, and uh, so this is the closing event of the Ulicka Summer Academy. This is the first year, of course, of its existence and uh, was a bit experimental, but it had a lot of nice events throughout the summer. Um, I'm not going to sum summarize them here. I'll say just a few words about them after a few minutes. Uh, but I thought I'd give a little context, uh, frankly, by just uh, saying a few words about um, our branch of the Ulick Summer Academy. This, the theme this summer has indeed been uh, advanced computing, and um, and a lot of it has indeed been quantum computing. So I'm an advocate of quantum computing, so please bear with me, and I'll give you a few uh, thoughts about quantum computing here at Ulick. And uh, I would say it's, it's my hope, but it's a sort of long-term hope that these... Uh, developments at Ulich will actually connect with the work of, of mainstream computer science, which is represented by today's lecture. But the point of this slide is to show that um, we have actually a quite comprehensive program in quantum computing at Ulich, um, which uh, goes all the way from the development of of uh, uh, low-level parts, you might say, you know, real hardware uh, components, of the quantum computer, which are very special in quantum computers because they, you know, they have to have quantum properties. Uh, most of the rest of this are not so much quantum, but they're just about how to exploit uh, the things that quantum gives us. So um, that uh, from individual qubits, from individual, uh, you know, logic gates, we assemble systems. <clears throat> and with systems, we we use systems. You know, we uh, we have them as a user facility. This is a work in progress, I would say, at uh, at Ulich, uh, but certainly something we strive for. We hope that you know things, products developed in Ulich will be used, will be offered as user facility uh, devices in Ulich. Um, uh, a lot of expertise, you know, these are solid state quantum computers that we research, and they uh, draw a lot of expertise from the, um, our uh, deep strengths in things like uh, materials um, and in the characterization of materials to perfect these kind of chips. I'll show you one example in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I haven't yet talked about this corner, which I think in a sense is the, gives us the connection to today's speaker, that uh, we realize that quantum computers, uh, I mean, we've understood for some years how they will work 
as physicists, but physicists don't run computers. Physicists sort of know how to make the, the basic building blocks of quantum computers, but they don't know how to really run them. And running a computer is a very complex uh, process, and of course you need applications, but you, you need also software, also control software, also other layers that, uh, you know, things like reliability and security and things like that eventually become uh, highly important. In a rudimentary form, they're already important in the existing unique uh, facility, but I think uh, eventually this story will need much more of that. Now, you see... Um, uh, these in small type are the various um, Jülich departments, and of course the insiders, are, our speaker is not so so conversant with all of these little uh, uh, things, you know. So if I gave him a quiz, what is PGI nine? He said, "Well, you know, PGI nine. What is it?" And but he could tell me what uh, I don't know what uh, info systems chair number three is or something. So you could also blast me with uh, with uh, things that I don't know. But these are all codes for, you know, big vital groups of people, you know, tens of people, each one of these tens of people, you know, working on uh, exciting projects, spanning a whole range from, uh, the, you know, the basic aspects of these things from and all the way to the applications aspects. But quantum computing is a rather unique thing in that it has participation from so many of these departments. And if you look, have some view of the org chart, of uh, of ULIC. you see, it's all spread out all over the place. That a, a big stack of it is in the you might say solid state institute, the uh, Peter Grunberg Institute. But um, it wouldn't work without uh, the ULIC Supercomputing Center from the Institute of Advanced Studies, and it also wouldn't work without the contributions from the Central Electronics Institute. So, um, what I represent is the uh, the sort of uh, the uh, the timekeeper, or the um, how shall I say it, the um, the referee of a, a, the group of leaders from these institutes who form what is called UCA. I thought I had spelt it out here. No, it's here. So uh, this set of um, group um, of um, institutes from all over the campus form an activity with this common goal to. Um, Put it put to life or put into life the uh, complex set of things that I just showed you of how you would build a quantum computer and um, I could say there's what what I'm uh, not at all doing justice to is there are several other of these uh, activities on campus there is Yunka and I see here the leader of Yunka welcome uh, today uh, which is trying something similar for neuromorphic computing there's also Kaza Kaza what how do I decode that um, but that's another center activity, multidisciplinary activity in uh, advanced computing applications. Okay, but we um, have a very specific, as you see, vision, bringing quantum computing advantage to society. Um, <clears throat> if you, you know, and if you dig deeper, we have a mission for that, which is to develop, provide, and improve quantum computing devices and knowledge in cooperation with our partners. And then there's a set of specific goals. I mean, at this level, it's not uh, super specific, but it, it does point you to the fact that, yes, we are focusing on solid-state qubits. There are other forms of qubits. Uh, out in the world, but uh, our objective is to perfect them and to, uh, you know, achieve this, um, uh, you know, this overall uh, goal this, of accomplishing this new form of computing. So I thought I'd throw in here, but this can also be for later discussion, uh, uh, that I, I'm giving you two examples from all the way from the far left of my diagram to the far right. So the far left means, you know, the sort of basic fundamental hardware. And um, <clears throat> so the quantum computer has a chip. And these chips uh, in this particular example involve uh, a semiconductor structure in which there are single electrons, really ones you could give names to if you felt like, and they have to be moved around in very specific ways. So that's a remarkable piece of technology, and that enables the um, the performance of gate operations, of logic gate operations. And uh, this group of uh, the PGI-11 um, has made a lot of progress on this uh, 
on, on advancing this technology just in the last year. So that's a major accomplishment of our of our recent work. I'm not going to say all the details that are mentioned on this slide. Now to go to the all the way to the other end, um, using the so-called quantum annealer of the uh, UNIC department within the UNIC supercomputing center. Um, they have access, or they own, in fact, a um, a particular kind, a style of quantum device, which is called the D-wave quantum annealer. So that is not a home, not a, a locally built device. That's actually one provided by a corporation, and a certain style of quantum type qu computation. And they're busy trying to use it for things. And so, in this case, it's uh, solving certain problems in protein structure. So with uh, recent, uh, recent accomplishments in that direction. So now it's not my role here to tell you about these accomplishments, but uh, if those of you who have been uh, attending the ULIC Summer Academy have had plenty of opportunity to learn details of these accomplishments in, through the, uh, uh, in total 30 events, uh, including, for example, spring and summer schools. Here I am lecturing to a group at the ULIC Supercomputing Center, and this is, uh, I think, a tour that was conducted at the ULIC Supercomputing Center. And, um, uh, well, that's our publicity photo, but this is a picture of the most advanced quantum computing lab that we have for ex exploratory development of superconducting quantum bit systems. Um, I note that while this is a ULIC Institute, it's, it's uh, right on the Aachen campus, so it's exemplary of our strong linkages with the Aachen University. So um, I'm going to uh, now gradually tell you more about what we're going to hear today. Um, I, I give our speaker this five-minute warning, but I still have a couple of more um, interesting observations. <clears throat> so uh, we close the ULIC Summer Academy with today's lecture. I will tell you much more about our speaker in a couple of minutes, but you notice that the subject uh, that he comes to us from software modeling and verification. There's not the word quantum in it, there's not the word neuro in it either, but um, they are definitely words that we should know. That uh, if we, uh, well, if I say, if we pretend that we can build new styles of computers, we better know what these things are. We better draw from these uh, disciplines. Now, I'm going to mention the title of his lecture in a moment, but I'll tell you that his lecture gives me a kind of weird association. So you might say, what does this have to do with anything? Um, so I jump to the Nobel Prize in Physics 2012. What does this have to do with anything? This, this was, in fact, one of the Nobel Prizes that honors the uh, sort of scientific underpinnings of quantum computing. <clears throat> so that's why we do like to point to it. But there's a more specific reason I point to this this uh, this prize. It's not because we, we actually don't do ions in traps or uh, even so much photons in cavities. We do a tiny bit of that. But there's a famous lecture that was given by this laureate, by Serge Haroche, actually in quite a few years previous to that. And here's the title of his lecture. And um, quantum computing dream or nightmare was what he said. And this was a magazine article version of his lecture. And so he challenged people to say, uh, are we really on track in quantum computing? And I would definitely agree in the year 1996, we weren't. Uh, we were still ages and ages off from uh, having quantum computers. And so it was fair to say dream or nightmare. And I'm afraid, you know, people have had nightmares trying to deal with their uh, current, you know, research problems in, in quantum computing. Now, t today's lecture will not be uh, dreams or nightmares, but it's dreams or reality. So... Um, um, I've now come, okay, this is the end of my short uh, uh, ideas, set of ideas about the academy and about our setting here. So my only uh, job now is to say a little bit more about our speaker. So I'm very pleased to have my uh, colleague, to the extent that I'm still a professor at the RBTH, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Joost Peter Katun of the uh, Computer Science Department of the university, but uh, here, just so you can see his timeline, he's uh, of course a native of the Netherlands, and you see his studies were at the University of Twente, and if you look on a map, it's just straight, you just go straight up north for a few hours, and there you are at, at lovely uh, 
the university, technical university of Twente. Uh, my daughter is presently a student there, so I've gotten to uh, be very charmed by the, uh, the university. So a master's in computer science, and then I see a double doctorate. I didn't actually know that before I looked at your bio, but you had both a doctorate in engineering at uh, TU Eindhoven, and also back for a real doctorate, it looked like, in computer science back to Twente. And then after a not very large number of years, he was a professor here at RBTH and uh, was designated a distinguished professor in uh, some years after that. And he's presently the head, uh, or I might even say the chair, perhaps, of the head of, uh, of the software modeling and verification at RBTH. So without further ado, I ask you to uh, listen to um, the lecture today, Efficient and Reliable Hardware and Software, Dream or Reality. Yes, Peter. I think we have to somehow change. Ah, this goes automatically. That's uh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Uh, honestly, I feel a bit nervous as a computer scientist to um, to give a talk at this uh, prestigious. Uh, let's say, uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here, and, and it's an honor for me to, uh, to give a presentation. And as uh, David already mentioned, I want to talk about uh, efficient and reliable, and I would say the focus is more on reliable, and I hope that I can also show you that you can use similar means not only to check reliability, but also efficiency. And we're going to see whether this is uh, maybe a dream or reality. And at the end, um, I'm going to start with, uh, with, let's say, results in computer science. And at the end, I, I made an attempt to also bridge towards quantum. So let's see uh, whether that uh, uh, can bring anything. Uh, be able to get rid of this uh, mute icon? Uh, is that an example of software reliability? No, I don't know. I mean, it should be. I don't know why this is there, yeah. honestly. Yeah, it's just there. Um, maybe try turning it on again and see what happens. We try to switch it off and switch I it on again. It doesn't. I mean, I, uh, it's 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 bothering me a bit. But anyway, um, so I would like to to start off uh, with uh, 1949, Alan Turing, and I guess you know what for you in physics is Nobel Prize in uh, co computer science is the Turing Award. And let's say reliability is one of the areas where most Turing Awards have been awarded, and we will, let's say, encounter a few of them during the talk uh, today. So um, uh, Turing um, wrote a paper where he presented this program. It's written as a diagram. And the way to read this is that uh, you start on the left. There are a couple of program variables. The dashed ones mean that these are, will be the new values. So this simply means that R is set to 1 and U is set to 1. Then the control goes to here, and then it says that V, I mean this value, is becoming the old value of U, which was 1, so now V becomes 1, 2. Right? That's the way to read this. And then you see here is a test. It tests whether R equals N. If this is not the case, the negation, then you go here. If it is the case, you stop, and the algorithm terminates. And otherwise, you go into this loop, and you see here is an innermost loop, but there's also an outermost loop, right? And the challenge is, what's the, what does this program compute? Um, if you have an answer, you're most welcome to uh, already, uh, let's say, say this. Um, uh, something with integers, indeed. Uh, indeed, it does. And this uh, comes, and now this is annoying that it's there. It's, uh, it's from the report, and I've, I found this interesting. Uh, it's a report on uh, highly automatic calculating machines. We're talking about 1949. Yeah? Um, anyway. Um, and then this quest was as follows. Okay, now I give you this program as this diagram, but how can I check this routine in the sense of making sure that it is right? And is this program correct? In order that the man who checks may not have too difficult a task, the programmer should make a number of definite assertions. Assertions are annotations to the program, logical assertions, which can be checked individually and from which the correctness of the whole program easily follows. That was his argument, 1949. And then after some end, finally, the checker should verify that the process reads the program 
also becomes to an end. That means that the program terminates. Good. So there are clear two things, assertions and termination. And that will be leading also in this talk. And this was the proof he was provided. So this is literally a copy of the paper in 1949. Here you again see the program. The program he annotated with A, B, C, and so on. And then he inserted assertions to the locations in this graph, right? And this graph is nothing else than a graphical notation of what you nowadays would write down as a program. Um, and he was inserting this. Well, this is still a bit hard to understand, so maybe I try to make this a little bit more re readable, and this is the readable, hopefully more readable version. So maybe I go just through some examples. So here, let's assume that this is correct, what he's saying. So he asserted here that on this edge, so going from this assignment to that assignment, the following statement is true. R is always between S and N. U is S times R, I mean, faculty. And V is our faculty, okay? And then how does he proceed? Well, then he says he go to the next statement. Now, what you see in this statement, U becomes U plus V. V is our faculty. U was S times our faculty, so now it becomes S plus one times our faculty, right? I hope that's easy to understand, and that's how he proceeds. And then, for instance, here you see that S becomes S plus one, and that means, for instance, that this S, which is here at most R, now becomes S minus 1 at most R. Yeah? Because S has just been increased by 1. So in this way, you annotate your program with extra information. And based on this extra information, you try to prove, for instance, uh, the correctness of this program. And the correctness of this program is written down here, that the output of the program is N faculty. So this program computes given an input n, any arbitrary natural number n, or integer n, it will compute n faculty. Good. And that's what this annotation says. Good. Um, now make a big jump. Why is this relevant? Uh, correctness of software is one of the key issues in computer science. I'm not saying this because I'm leading the chair on software modeling and verification. But if you look at the literature, correctness of the programs is always an issue. If people present a new algorithm, the first thing that they need to prove is, is this algorithm computing the right thing? Second thing, is this algorithm terminating? Does it hold? Yeah. Good. And unfortunately, software does not always conform to these two requirements. So here I brought some examples. This is the TRAC-25. It's a radiation machine for cancer patients. So it puts cancer patients under a radiation. And unfortunately, several casualties. And why? Because there was a software bug, so that the radiation was too high. The intensity was simply exceeding certain thresholds. Here is an example of uh, Southwest Airlines, where there was a software system failure uh, no casualties, but uh, a couple of flights had to be cancelled or delayed. And this was a guess between, uh, I mean, costing about this amount. Just one software bug. Uh, the Ariana uh, 5 is another famous example in 1996. Exploded somewhere here. Actually, itself exploded. And why? Because there was a problem converting something from 32 bits to 16 bits. There was a legacy problem in the software that apparently they thought we can just use the software from the Ariana 4, also in the Ariana 5, but for some cases it doesn't work. There's a big issue at the moment, and that's a big discussion in AI. This is a self-driving car of uh, Uber, and actually that crashed, I think it was Phoenix, Arizona, uh, because also there was a, a software error. And this is um, uh, an operation machine, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a surgery machine, Da Vinci C, which is used in many, many different hospitals. Um, and actually, detailed studies in Canada uh, revealed that there is a software error in one out of, what is it, 1,200 surgeries, which seems sounds relatively correct, but I'd rather be not one of those one out of 1,200 surgeries, right? Do you think it would be fair to say that software always has bugs? Software, uh, yeah, so, so Microsoft uh, revealed that uh, they, uh, for instance, their, so their operating systems, they will have bugs, and they are, they are fine if this number of bugs is below a certain threshold. Yeah. Yeah. 
But the aim is to go towards zero defect software, as we call it. But okay. And this is a, a report of the Consortium for IT Software Quality in the US. It's a few years old, 2018. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this, but this was the estimated cost per year due to bugs in software. Trillion. Yeah, okay. 2.84 trillion. Trillion, okay. Lots of money. Yeah, <laughs> good. So it's not su a surprise that software reliable I I is important and also a grand challenge. And this, for instance, has been acknowledged by the largest society on computer science in Germany, the Gesellschaft für Informatik. And their software reliability is one of the grand challenges in Germany since a couple of years already of this German society of computer science. Good. Now, there are two main approaches towards correctness or reliability. One is called model checking, and the other one is deductive verification. And I'm going to uh, try to explain and also, yeah, show a bit what the impact of these techniques have been so far in industry. So what is model checking? This was developed in uh, 1981 by these three people. Well, actually, there are four people. There were two independent papers, both in 1981. Uh, this person wrote this paper with a co-author, and this co-author did not receive the Turing Awards, but those three got. And maybe after a beer, I can maybe explain you why. Uh, not now. And this was a Turing Award in 2007. So what's the idea? The idea is that uh, rather than taking a program, we're going to make a model of the system. We're going to take a property that we would like to check and we put this in this box and think about this box as there are a lot of algorithms in there. Okay? And now you can either check whether the property is fulfilled, which means this model fulfills the property. Now, if you put in the wrong model, then of course uh, no guarantees, right? I mean, it's model checking. It's not a real system that you check. <laughs> And then either you can provide a counterexample, that's also very useful, because then you know why the model does not satisfy the property, or, and that's you cannot read, but it says property satisfied. So I brought you a tiny example that I hope you all understand. It's, uh, oh, I don't, and I first got to the definition, then I got to the example. So model checking is an automated technique that giving a finite state model of a system and a property systematically checks whether this property holds in that model. So in terms of the way people write this in computer science, it says we have a model, you have a property, and you check whether the model satisfies the property. Okay? Important is that uh, you should think about this as a kind of state di transition diagram. I get to an example, and here a kind of mathematical logical formula. I also have an example of this, and then you, the answer is indeed the model satisfies the property or not. Uh, notice that this is decidable because uh, the model is finite. Yeah? So we will see later that you also have to sometimes look at undecidable problems. And the toy example I brought for you is the wolf, goat, cabbage puzzle that you are all familiar with. We have a river bank, and here is a, a ferryman. There is a goat, there is a wolf, and somewhere there should be a cabbage. Okay? And you all know the problem. They have to be bro brought to the other side of the river. Okay? And I'm going to solve this for you by means of model checking. Uh, not because this is the most efficient way of solving it, just as a piece of illustration. Yeah. Good. So the first thing we have to do, remember this picture, is we have to provide a model. Okay, how does the model look like for this system? What well, looks as follows. The way to read this is as follows. We start in this configuration, and it says the, the cabbage, the ferryman, the goat, and the wolf are all on the left side of the river, which are numbered zero. Okay. And then you basically model all possible scenarios. So one possible scenario is that you take the cabbage and the ferryman and they go to the other side of the river. This happens when you take this edge. So then are we in this configuration. And now, for instance, the ferryman can go back alone, leaving the cabbage on the other side. And that means we go to this configuration. And what you see here is that the cabbage is on the other side of the river and the other, other three are over here, okay? Good, and this model is basically a state transition diagram modeling all possible possibilities of this, let's say, puzzle. Good, now we have to check which is the property. Of course, we want to bring everybody to the other side, but of course we want to avoid that the wolf eats the goat and that the goat eats the cabbage, okay? 
So how are we going to do this? Again, this picture, we have a system property, and the system property looks like this. So let me try to explain this. What this says is the following. What is our target? The target is that the cabbage, the ferryman, the goat, and the wolf are on the other side of the river, all with index one. What should happen before this situation is reached? Well, if the wolf and the, uh, and the goat are together, there should also be the ferryman. So if these two are at the same riverbank, the subscript I is the same, then the ferry, ferry should also be at that end. Yeah? Otherwise, this is a bad situation. Yeah? Because the wolf will grab his chance and, of course, uh, eat the, the gulf. Similarly, if the cabbage and the goat are on this riverbank, there should be, the, again, the ferryman to, to make sure that the goat is not consuming the cabbage. Okay? And this we want to ensure for both riverbanks. That's what is this conjunction is saying. Good. So this you can put into the specification. Actually, what I'm doing is putting the negation in this specification. Why? Because then I'm trying to, going to give you a counterexample, and this counterexample will be a schedule that brings everybody to the other side of the riverbank in the correct way. Good. So this is the outcome. And the outcome uh, says basically we get a counterexample. And this counterexample, this is the way the counterexample looks like. So this is what the model checker generates for you. Uh, here is a scenario that brings everybody to the other side of the riverbank without the wolf eating the goat and the goat eating the cabbage. Okay, I hope this gives you an idea what you, what a model is, what a, what a property is, and what you can do with model checking. Now, of course, this is a toy example. In reality, systems are much bigger and much more complicated. So this is a, actually already simplified model of a Hubble telescope uh, where you maybe would like to prove certain properties. Uh, this is still, it fits on one slide. Most models do not fit on one slide. So a real, uh, let's say, obstacle, or I would say challenge of model checking is what they call the state explosion problem try to tackle systems that are as large as possible, as efficient as possible. Um, so my question is, uh, you're now depicting models as diagrams like, uh, like Turing did, but is there an efficient uh, language for models that's not just diagrams? Yeah, so the language that uh, actually um, uh, Turing was using what graphs. These are state transition diagrams. I can transform graphs into state transition diagrams. You can take a Java program or a C++ program. You can take any favorite programming language and map it onto state transition diagrams. And of course, there are different input languages depending on whether your program has concurrency, whether it has no concurrency, whether your program allows pointers, whether you don't allow pointers. So depending on the features you would like to model, there are different languages. There is not one silver bullet there. But claim you can map almost everything to state transition diagrams. Good. Examples where this has been used. Now, one of the main examples is uh, uh, the model checker SLAM, developed by Microsoft. Microsoft develops operating systems. And the most vulnerable talk is not the operating system itself, but the interface to software or hardware that you can connect to the hardware, to the operating system. So they made what they call a device driver model checker. So if you have a printer, let's say of HP, you would like to connect it to Windows, what is operating system seven, then M Microsoft did a formal check on the interface of the HP software and hardware to check whether it's conforming to what their operating system was offering. If not, it goes back to HP and HP has to tweak it so that it matched the specification of Microsoft. Microsoft did not check their own software, yeah, but all the software of, and the reason for that was they claimed this is the most vulnerable place where errors occur. <laughs> This is an example, it's a Needham Schroeder security protocol. It was running on all kinds of different machines. So it is used in cryptography. Um, it was running for 17 years and 17 years, after 17 years, uh, researchers at the University of Oxford revealed a bug in this protocol, okay? By means of model checking. NASA is using model checking intensively. Actually, one of the first model checkers, the tools that are on the market, is developed by Holtzman, 
a Dutchman which is already, who is already many, many years at, uh, at NASA in Pasadena. Um, and they develop, uh, let's say, for models for, let's say, uh, these kind of uh, engines, uh, Mars landers. Uh, they really check these things that they send to Mars, that they try to land on Mars by first making models and doing model checking on those. Yeah? Because you can imagine if something catastrophic happens there on Mars, you cannot, like on your mobile, uh, basically update your software and you're done. That's not that easy anymore. Yeah? Good. And uh, the last one is hardware. So there is an, actually an international standard. It's the IEEE standard, which is initiated because of model checking. <laughs> Um, there is a, a logical language, so the language in which I express this property in the, in the, I mean, bringing everybody to the other side of the riverbank, which is, I didn't mention it, but this is temporal logic. And there is a language, temporal logic language, it has been standardized by IEEE and is used intensively by hardware industry. And Intel has been one of the main initiators uh, for uh, developing this and standardizing this language. Uh, this example I brought uh, because I'm Dutch. Um, you know that almost two-thirds of the Netherlands is below sea level. So there were big floodings in 1953. And in the Netherlands, what they did, they, made, they, they built many dikes. But in particular, they built a special thing to protect the harbor of Rotterdam. So what they built was a system. It's over here. So here is Rotterdam. Here is the North Sea. And what they built is, uh, is what you see on this picture over here. And to get a kind of idea about the size, this is as big as one Eiffel Tower. Okay, so you basically have here two Eiffel Towers laying here. And the idea is that they close when, yeah, yeah, when the weather forecast is basically saying that there will be terrible weather and basically we should protect the harbor. Um, if this happens, it's headlines in the Netherlands. This is on the television, this is in your newspaper. It happens usually once a year, probably. But it's completely software controlled whether this is a wise decision or not. We can discuss about this, but it is developed as a purely software control system. And also here, the software, not completely, because it was too large, but partially in the critical parts, again, the interfaces between several industrial partners involved in this project were checked with model checking. Good. Now, what we do, or what I do basically in my group, is a lot on probabilistic model checking. And I'm going to explain this, and then we go to deductive verification. And then I'm going to hope, make clear to you that going from probabilities to quantum is, to my opinion, I hope not so much a big leap. So random phenomena are ubiquitous. There are a couple of examples here. I won't go through all of them. But here you, for instance, have a robot. This robot is, uh, let's say, positioned here, and it has to find the exit, which is at 12. But um, yeah, at equally colored places, it cannot distinguish them. So for instance, in five, it cannot distinguish whether it's at position five or whether it's at position seven or at 10, because it has partial observability. There are cameras, and it cannot explore the full, let's say, environment of it. And that means that only based on the partial view of the world, you have to make decisions. Yeah? But you can already see, I mean, if for instance, those two are equally colored, here the best decision is to go to the left, whereas here the best decision is to go to the right. Yeah? And actually what you can prove is that you need randomization, so sometimes you need to flip a coin to be optimal, to let's say optimally, I mean, to minimize the expected number of steps to find the exit, for instance, and you need memory. This is encoded in this 101x and so on. I'm going, not going to explain this. But it means that your, the robot, the planning of the robot, is uh, subject to certain uncertainties here. Um, in self-driving cars, I had an example already in the beginning. These cars have to drive in a certain environment. You don't know in advance how the environment will, let's say, react, how it will act. Um, and therefore, the environment is uncertain, and you have to cope with this uncertainty. And here it's supposed to write down security. Also, in security systems, I mean, you wouldn't like to have your system secure ag against, for instance, attacks. You don't know what's the power of an attacker. You don't know when he or she is going to attack. Um, so these are a lot of uncertainties. And actually, what people use a lot are probabilities there to be optimally, let's say, sure against, for instance, attacks. <laughs> Good. Be sure. Regarding the probability which you mentioned, uh, here do we use the uh, 
like the model of uh, non-deterministic finite automata uh, to get it or um, because in, uh, if we use DFA then uh, like we have a set uh, uh, so yeah, the question was like uh, to be uh, modeled through the non-deterministic finite automata uh, rather than the DFA, or how is it? Um, it depends on the uncertainty you would like to model. Either you have information about, let's say, the quantity. You suppose you can go right and left, then you know something maybe about the frequency of going left and right, and then you can model this adequately with, with probabilities. Sometimes this information is deliberately not at your disposal, then you model this by non-determinism. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have partial observability, which is again something which is uncertain. And these three together, so you have models that can cope with all of them. Okay. So non-deterministic automata can also only model, let's say, non-determinism, but not model the other two phenomena. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Thanks. So in probabilistic model checking is basically you take a finite state probabilistic model, right where you have basically probabilities and you have a property and then the question is basically looks like follows you have a model for instance models that are used often are markov decision processes these are non-deterministic automata with probabilities and then you're no longer interested in a in a property but you're interested is the probability that the certain property holds exceeds a certain threshold for instance a half okay so there are quantitative information here but there's also quantitative information there Good. Um, so what you can do is basically you can take, for instance, a kind of a probabilistic program. I will give an example in a minute. You generate again a graph, as we have seen before, but now with probabilities on the edges, information about the frequencies, if you want. Now you also have properties. So this says with probability less than 1 over 10, eventually the system will reach a fail state. Yeah, so eventually something bad is going to happen. Yeah, it doesn't say when it's going to happen, but it says eventually, after an arbitrary number of steps, my system is going to fail. And now you can put this again into a model checker. Of course, it has to deal also with, let's say, the numerical... I mean, there is some numerical mathematics there to compute things with probabilities. Um, and it will also can, can give you curves, or it can give you counterexamples, but it will tell you, uh, basically, it, does this model satisfy this property or does it not? So very similar as the, the previous thing, but now with, with probabilities. And here is an example. Again, it's a simple puzzle. Um, this puzzle is as follows. We have a fully booked airplane, airplane, and passengers are queuing. Okay? All passengers have their boarding pass, except the first passenger who lost her or his boarding pass. Okay? So we have a queue of people who want to enter the plane. The first person lost his or her boarding pass. And he or she enters the plane, and what happens? She randomly picks a seat. Now, oh my God, I lost my ticket, enters the plane, and randomly picks a seat. Okay? What are the other passengers doing? They have a boarding pass. They take their seat if the seat on the boarding pass is free, obviously. And otherwise, they randomly pick a seat. Okay? Question. How likely is it that the last passenger, so the very fast last person in the, in the queue, gets the seat on her boarding pass? Okay? Good. It's, of course, a toy example like my goat, cabbage, uh, and so on. You can model this by a program. So E is the capacity of the plane. So I have a plane with 1,000 places. And now, uh, basically, uh, you roll, uh, uh, basically, the first passenger enters, right, with probability 1 over 1,000. It grabs a certain seat, and with the other probability, it doesn't grab a seat. The number of passengers that still has to board is one less, because the first passenger boarded. And then, basically, all the others have to board, according to the scheme I just explained. So you can encode this in a kind of program. Important is this program is probabilistic, right, because you have here... This happens with probability 1 over E, and this happens with probability 1 minus 1 over E. Okay, if you now just put this in a model checker, which we did, um, and this is the capacity of the plane. Uh, you may ask yourself, uh, do those planes exist? Yeah, you have planes like this. Um, then this is the amount of time that we need to check this property. Okay? Good. Uh, and you see that for 10 million uh, seats, this is a model, a graph, let's say, if you would model this as a graph with... 
yeah, a constant factor more than this, but let's say up to 40, 50, 000, uh, 50 uh, million states, you can still check this in a reasonable amount of time. Good. And I have here a plot. Uh, here is a plot that plots on the x-axis the size of these uh, probabilistic models, and on the y-axis uh, the amount of time, and both axes are log scale. Okay, so you have to look at this, and every point is an instance of a certain case study with a certain property. So just to simplify, this is for 1 million states, and this is about 10 million states. Yeah? So this is roughly, you get hopefully an idea of how this, how this technique scales. And this is something that we heavily worked on in Aachen. We built our own tool that you see on the top right corner of the slide. And I'm, I'm happy to say that we are really at the frontier uh, of, this, uh, of this kind of uh, research. So I would like to now give you some examples what you can do with this. Yeah? I'm not going to explain what is all underneath. But I uh, would like to give you a few examples. So this is an example uh, that we uh, performed for this uh, Dutch company, Recor. They built uh, software for face recognition at airports. Okay? So there are different things like capturing, then you extract something, then you compare what you just have seen with maybe a database, and then hopefully you have matched that uh, I am really the person that is on my passport. Yeah. Good. Um, this is a model that this company actually gave us. Um, I get back to David's question. This was a language that didn't, we, it was not in our repository of all languages that we were supporting yet. So the first thing that you typically have to do, you have to understand with specialists from the domain, what does this exactly mean? Yeah. Uh, again, it's a graph, I fully agree, but it's not the type of graph you usually uh, in our field see. So that was the first thing, and there's a lot of things underneath, and that's um, the typical, the first question that we have to handle. It looks all simple. But now we modeled it in our kind of graph. So here um, is a face recognition. See the number of states, it looks like 100,000 and so on. It looks like reasonable. But then still you would like to do certain computations. So what we computed for them were probabilities um, where actually um, in this system there are buffers and these buffers can overflow. And if they overflow, you don't recognize the picture correctly anymore. Yeah. And this is what we computed for them, for, uh, depending on several parameters in, in the model, using these uh, model checking techniques. Good, I skipped this. Uh, good. Another example that I'm uh, trying to do is uh, we also use this for synthesizing robot control programs. So the idea is roughly as follows. Um, you give me a program, but the program is not a full program, it's a partial program. We call this a program sketch. The way I explain this is typically there are programs with holes. Okay, so you give me a skeleton, but there are many fragments of the program that are not known because there are details they are missing. So this is this question mark one here or this question mark two. There could be whole statements that are question marks. And that gives actually um, rise to a kind of family because you can plug in here all kind of different options. You can plug in here different kind of options. So if you look at all possible combinations, you get here a range of possible combinations. And now you give me a property that says, for instance, that with probability less than 0.1, you eventually should reach a failure. And for instance, the expected amount of costs that this robot has to do when it moves around uh, until it finishes should be minimal. And what we try to do is you automatically try to synthesize a program. So this is the program where the holes are filled. That's what is in this square brackets. And that should satisfy this property. So it's a kind of correctness by design by saying, OK, I roughly know how my program looks like. Right? Um, I also tell you what are all the possible options. And now can you for me synthesize the best option or the option that satisfies my specification? Theory of uh, the sort of most expressive program sketches? In general, this is an undecidable problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, indeed, uh, what you would like to do is you would like to, uh, yeah, basically only look at specific cases in order to stay within the realm of model checking, which means that you still need to be decidable. Yeah. So, there are compromises here. Yeah. I'm not saying that every program with arbitrarily many holes can be solved. I think I have an example. So this robot controller actually was uh, synthesized automatically. We, had, we started with a program that had 22 holes, okay? And the idea was here to find a controller, so a piece of software that's controlling this robot, 
that no matter where it starts, it will find the exit. It should find the exit yeah, without failing, and it should find the exit in a minimal number of steps on expected number of steps. Um, there are 9.4 million strategies. So that means in this picture, this family is a 9.4 million pieces. So there are 9.4 million, let's say, instances of this control program. Um, each program is not that big, but if you have to, let's say, check 9.4 million programs of this size, you have to do quite a bit of work. Uh, this takes you about two days. Um, but we developed algorithms to do this in a much more clever way, and within one hour, you can compute this strategy. Now, you might say one hour is still long. I agree. But the program is correct by construction. Yeah? It satisfies this specification. And therefore, you know that this control strategy, in the end, is satisfying. Hopefully, is this capturing what you want? Uh, it satisfies then what, what this robot is uh, supposed to do. Is it uh, the normal, like, the standard practice failure rate? Is it the standard practice to have the failure rate to be 10% or is it less or more? No, it depends on your application, right? I mean, uh, this is, uh, I would say, still very liberal. I mean, typically this is 0 0.0.0.0.0.01. Yeah. 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 And this also has an effect on the amount of time for computation and so on. So there are several aspects here. Yeah. Good. So here is, a, a, I think, the last example that I showed. This is a, a swarm of satellites. So these satellites are, uh, let's say, traversing a kind of orbit. But uh, sometimes they can change their orbit. At certain specific points, they can change the orbit. And the idea, of course, is that you would like to avoid collisions. So, uh, and the idea is that, uh, yeah, if you change from one orbit to another orbit, it will cost a certain amount of energy. And therefore, the satellites are out there. Uh, they're all supposed to be only, uh, let's say, uh, opposed to solar uh, energy. So you also would like to uh, basically minimize the amount of fuel. OK, so avoiding collisions, minimal amount of fuel. Um, we were able to actually analyze this system and were able to reduce the uh, trajectory length and the cost by about uh, 50%. And uh, the kind of models that we uh, synthesize and, and, and try, try to transport this again in the terminology I used before, these are the number of holes, if you want, so the number of unknowns, yeah? um, and this is the number of states in your, in your graph, the kind of pictures I showed you before of, the, of the, let's say, the, the goat and the wolf and the cabbage, but now it's about 200,000. But here we were able to deal with 10,000 holes and then still be able to find such a control strategy. Okay. Good. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, I think I'll skip this example because I want to go to the... We also did some criticality assessment of the railway, but I'm going to skip this. Okay. Because I want to come to the, uh, the second uh, technique. Model checking is a technique um, I told you Turing Award um, used for finite state systems. It's heavily used for hardware. It's also used for software. But there is this restriction. The number of states, your graph, must be finite. This is an obstacle. Because there are many programs where the number of states that you can have is unbounded. Yeah. We will see some examples. And therefore, there is this technique called deductive program verification. So. Deductive program verification is a syntax-based technique. That means we're not going to run the program. I'm not going to test the program on specific inputs. I'm literally only looking at the syntax, at the language in which your program is written. And then, again, you give me a property, like we have seen before. And now you systematically check whether this property holds when the program terminates. It's a syntax-based technique. We're going to add assertions like Turing to our program. But now, systematically, I would say Turing in 1949 did this quite ad hoc. Um, and you check this property. And what Turing already said at the end, you also need to check that your program terminates. So this is the picture. You now have a program. You have a property. It's in jargon of computer science called the post condition. Why is it called the post condition? It's a condition, a property that holds when the program terminates, so after the end. Good. Um, this is undecidable. 
because programs are uh, not finite state anymore. So here we have to deal with a program. You cannot develop an algorithm like a model checker that solves this problem for you. Such algorithm doesn't exist. So you have to do something else, and it means also the techniques that you develop are typically semi-decidable. They work for specific classes of programs, but not always, because of the undecidability. <laughs> Good, so here, this is what we have seen before, right? Turing's program, um, this is the post condition. Can you prove for me that at the end of the program, and the program stops, indeed, you compute and faculty, and you add systematically assertions to your program, and already Turing was doing this because these were examples of these assertions. But I mentioned he did this in an ad hoc manner. So there were two seminal people who tried to systemize this. And this is uh, Tony Hoare, actually I should say Sir Tony Hoare, because officially by the Queen, when the Queen was still living, uh, um, made him a Sir. Um, and uh, he uh, was awarded the Turing Award for this work, and he provided rules that said, okay, if you give me a program P, and you can annotate in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, Turing, it was this, if, if you can annotate the incoming arrow with this formula, and you then have program P, then you can, let's say, annotate the outgoing arrow with this, if you have, if you convince me that this is correct, then, under the solid line, I can now also take a while thing, a loop, and this loop I can annotate with what is called an invariant, and then the invariant is also true at the end of the program, and then of course not B holds, because the loop has terminated, which means this condition of the loop is false. He provided those rules, they're called Hoare triples, seminal work in the 19, end of the 1960s. Yeah, Tony Hoare, Sir Tony Hoare. And there was a Dutchman, uh, now, it's un very unfortunate that this uh, picture is completely uh, hiding this. It's Edsger Wiebe Dijkstra. Um, and he said, yeah, so this looks, if you look at this, it looks like a kind of a forward rule, right? I mean, it says, if you can annotate my program with this precondition and this postcondition, then the rule says, below the line, you can annotate this program with this pre and this postcondition. Uh, Dijkstra says, I don't like this. Uh, why don't we do this backwards? Yeah? First and foremost, I can put here in many, uh, many different eyes, and still maybe it works. I would like to have the weakest possible eye. I would like to have the weakest possible condition, such that if the program starts there, my program will terminate and satisfy the post condition. So he says, why don't we reason backwards? So his idea was, you start from the post condition, now suppose I have a program that consists of two parts, C1 and C2. He first wanted to have what is the weakest condition that this program must satisfy so that on termination that holds. And he called this the weakest precondition. And then he said, well, if you then want to compose C1 and C2, then you take this one and you push it back through here and then you get the weakest precondition of this program with respect to the weakest precondition here. Yeah. Good. Turing Award in 1972. Uh, you all know Dijkstra because Dijkstra is also well known for the shortest path algorithms, and shortest path algorithms are used in your uh, uh, device that I used here to drive here from Aachen to, um, to Jülich. You know? Good. Okay, so this were basically systemizing approaches for uh, uh, the idea of uh, Turing. And I would again like to show you some examples. So the first thing is a sorting algorithm. Now, I guess everybody knows what is a sorting algorithm. You have as input a set of natural numbers. And at the end of the day, you would like to have the set sorted. So the output is something which is sorted and contains the same numbers as the input. There is a very uh, well-known algorithm called TIM sort. And this is used in Python, Java, but also maybe in your mobile phone. Yeah, and researchers, and you see the researchers here in the Netherlands and Germany, found out that this is unfortunately wrong. Yeah, so people were using it, it was running on your mobile, it was running in, in Python in the standard library. And I think this was a paper of 2015, 2016, where they showed using the techniques I just showed you by annotation, actually they used a lot of automation in there uh, to, to prove that this is uh, wrong. And uh, now it's hard to see, but uh, the bug was pro proven to occur. I mean, you can answer, why did nobody notice so far? Yeah. 
Well, they proved that the bug was proven to occur for our inputs of at least size 2 to the power 16 for Android version 6 or 2 to the power 26 when Android version 7. Yeah, so you may argue, well, maybe this error does not occur so frequently, but you better know that it is buggy, yeah? that your sorting algorithm every now and then produces the wrong output. So I have a question about, yeah. also about the past, I remember something like 20 years ago, there was a new Intel microprocessor and had a buggy uh, arithmetic logic unit. Yeah. And uh, were they captured by any of these uh, techniques that you're describing? Uh, you know, so there was, a, was a rather gross bug once it was uncovered it was uh, you know really bad error really and maybe you refer error. to the fdi fdi4 uh, v error it was a floating point division floating point, uh, floating yeah. point, yeah, point yeah, division floating error point division. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this was uh, let's say mimicked later a posteriori by verification tools oh yeah. but it was sort of in the prehistory of these things yeah, yeah. Okay. it was 1996 uh, when this happened yeah yeah would it have been caught way faster with the current techniques? With maybe with current techniques, maybe yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is not only due to the let's say advance in the amount of techniques, but also in the advance of computational power that we nowadays have. So you can basically model check larger systems simply because systems have been become faster. Yeah. Um, so this is a bad. I, I I I have to apologize for this thing. This is a this is a screenshot of. Um, Amazon Web Services. So you may ask yourself, who is using this idea of Turing, Hoare, Dijkstra nowadays? Industry does. So Amazon Web Services has a whole team. Actually, they bought, uh, they bought really people from uh, Microsoft, from NASA, everywhere. They try to give them lots of money. Do you want to work for Amazon? They have now a team of about 40, 50 people. They work on verification. Why? Because if something goes wrong in the software of Amazon, it means their servers are not accessible anymore for a certain amount of time. And if they are not accessible, it means loss of money. Millions. Yeah? If on a Saturday Amazon is not reachable, you don't want to know what it costs, right? So they want to avoid this. Yeah? And the second important aspect is security attacks. Yeah? So there are two main reasons why these companies, uh, let's say, invest in this technology. And they develop a technology called Daphne, and this works on programs. And I don't want to go to the details. It's, again, a program that sorts, but this is just a coincidence. It says this is a post condition. It says, OK, you need to give me an input, and this input should not be a null list. It modifies the input, but it ensures that everything is sorted at the end. So this is my specification, the same as in my, let's say, goat and, and wolf example. Then you have the program and you annotate the program in a very similar style as, uh, as Turing was doing, but he used diagrams. But here it says, for instance, oh, I'm, I'm assuming something. Yeah, this is my assumption as a user. I assume that this formula holds. And now the prover is going to check, you're right. And if it's not the case, it provides you a counterexample. And then you can modify your assumption. Good. And this is uh, an invariant and, uh, and, and another in invariant. Um, and meta so formerly Facebook, um, they're using this. So every night, if the whole, um, I visited them in, in London, it's a, it's a huge, uh, huge premise. If they close at night, um, they have uh, verifier tools that are going to check all modifications that their programmers did on that day, such that if they come back the next day at their desk, there is a message in their mailing list that says, um, we think that this is not correct. We think that there is a bug. We think that here is a mistake in the software that you introduced maybe yesterday. Yeah? And they do this overnight. Yeah? And every day. Um, and they use this kind of technology. Good. Now, I want now to go to probabilistic, and now I would like to get a little bit more, a bit more technical, perhaps. <laughs> So I would like to show you how you can prove that the program terminates. So I'm not interested in does it sort at the end. I only want to know does it stop or not. Turing, in the same paper, he says, OK, I give you a suggestion how to do this. Use a variant function on a well-founded domain. And be sure that on every loop iteration, this is monotonically decreasing. Now, let me illustrate this. So this is the ID. Here you see on the x-axis every loop of a program. I mean, if the program has no loop, it's trivial to prove that it's terminating. Yeah. So the only real question is, what has happened when you have a loop? 
Yeah? So these are the number of loops. So here you start with the first loop, the second loop, the third loop, and so forth. This is the number of times that you take the loop, and what he says basically, try to think about a function called a variant function, V, that depending on which loop you are, basically goes down. And because this is defined on a well-founded domain, so what you have to make sure is that you always go down. In every loop iteration, the function goes down. Yeah? It cannot stabilize. It can definitely not increase. It should always go down. And then, mathematically speaking, it's defined on a well-founded domain. What does that mean? It means there is no infinite change, infinite chain of going down. Yeah? You only have finite chains. And that gives you the argument to prove that this is correct. Let me show you two examples and this, then you will understand. This program is simple, I hope. It says as long as integer x is strictly positive, increment x by one, uh, de decrement x by one. I want to prove that this terminates. This obviously terminates. Yeah? Uh, no matter which value of x I start with, I mean, this program will terminate. How do you prove this using the idea of Turing? You take a variant function. This variant function is simply x. Does it decrease in every iteration? Yes, it, de it, it, it decreases by one. It decreases by one. It's a, uh, uh, it's, an, it's a natural number, so it cannot go below zero, so there is only a finite number of going down. End of argument. This is a bit more difficult. We have an x and y, and as long as x and y are different, if x is larger than y, x becomes x minus y, so I subtract y from x, and otherwise I do the reverse. Claim this program terminates. Why? Now, now I have to think a bit more. The variant function says x plus y. And then you can show again that x plus y is actually decreasing in every step, and therefore you can only decrease finitely many times. Program terminates. Good. And now I want to bridge towards quantum by first looking at probabilistic programs. So first thing I need to explain to you is that by probabilistic programs, you cannot talk about just termination. You can terminate, for instance, with uh, always. You can terminate with probability one, which means there are behaviors that are infinite, but the total probability mass of all those behaviors is mass zero. That's not the same as always terminating, yeah, because then it says there is no infinite behavior of the program. And then uh, you can also distinguish between how many steps does a program need to actually terminate. I think the best is to look at an example again. So I brought you a one-dimensional random walk. It's a problem that people in stochastics, mathematicians, look at quite a bit. So how to read this? We start at position one. I could also have written here 100 or 10. It doesn't really matter, apart from the fact it should not be zero. Because then what I'm doing, as long as I am not at zero, I'm flipping a fair coin. This says with probability a half, I'm going to increment x by one or I'm going to decrement x by one. That's what this program does. So in terms of a picture, this is how it looks like. You have the line of natural numbers. You are in a certain position. You flip a fair coin with probability half, I go one position to the right or one position to the left. Yeah. This program is not always terminating. Yeah, because I can walk to the right, 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 to the right. But the probability that this happens is zero. Yeah, this program terminates with probability one. Good. I'm going now to make a small twist of this program. And you see the difference in the picture. The same at every position. I flip a fair coin. I got one position to the left and two to the right. Same question. Does this program terminate with probability one? Any guesses? No. Good. Uh, I agree. What's then the probability that this program will terminate? So, uh, that's a bit harder, right? I mean, so this is the difference, eh? x plus 2. This program uh, terminates with probability 1 minus the square root of 5 divided by 2. Interesting enough, it's an irrational number, although the program is only having a rational probability. Um, and by the way, uh, what I forgot uh, to tell you is uh, already for this example, uh, this example over here, probability one here, I was about to ask what's the expected number of steps to reach zero? So we know it's going to terminate with probability one. What's the expected number of steps? I, I start at one or at 10, it doesn't matter. 
what's the expected number of steps until I get to zero? Any suggestions? Sorry? N squared? No. No. It's not that easy. <laughs> it's infinite. You need infinitely many steps on expectation to reach zero, no matter where you start. Uh, no, I don't think it has uh, directly to do something with the harmonic series, but uh, in this case, not. I mean, these harmonic series are, of course, important if you want to prove that something is n log n or log n. But uh, in this case, it's infinite. Yeah? So what I wanted to say is that it terminates with probability 1, so you may say, hooray, right, this is good news. But the expected number of steps until termination is infinite. A computer scientist would say, well, that's a tautology. If the program terminates, then you always terminate infinitely many steps. Otherwise, you don't terminate, right? It's you're saying the same thing, but in two different ways. This is not the case here, and we're going to see in quantum this is also not the case. Yeah? And that's why I bring those examples. Good. Um, we came up with a rule to prove these kind of things, well, at least for some of the examples. And this is very similar to in the style of what, what, what Turing said. Maybe it goes a bit uh, too much in detail, but nonetheless, I, I try to make an argument. So again, we have to, this variant function, this function that has to go down. Now it's a probabilistic program, so this is actually a stochastic variable. And it means the expected value of this thing has to go down. Every now and then it may go up. Every now and then, every now and then it may go down very hard, but the expected thing should go down. That's the intuition. And then you need to say how much is it going to go down. And this is depending on two, two functions, P and D. They depend on the value of V. So V gives you a non-negative real number. They take this non-negative real number. This gives you a probability. And this gives you the amount of decrease. So basically what this is going to say is this V needs to decrease with at least d, and this must happen with probability at least p. Okay, so I give a lower bound on how fast this thing has to go down, and I also give a lower bound on which, which probability this is going to happen. Is this intuition roughly clear? Yeah, now the last thing, and then I get to the question, this is important, it's antitone. This means in my thing, if you go more and more towards termination, these functions have to grow. So you have to decrease faster, and this must happen with a larger and larger and larger probability. Okay? Good. And um, that basically is that what this rule says. Don't read those rules, it's too complicated. But then it says that the loop is almost surely terminating. Okay? So what is this theorem saying? It theorem says, okay, if you give me these three functions, that satisfy these two constraints, the ones that I just explained to you, the expected value does not increase, and with at least probability p, you decrease with at least d, then, end of theorem, the loop is asked. Okay? Good. One example to show application. The one-dimensional random walk that goes to one and one. Uh, the proof says, uh, take v is x, p is one, y p is one, well, you go one down, and this happens with probability half. So take p is a half, a one is a constant, and d is a half, you can't read this, um, and this is the end of the proof. If you look at books in mathematics, um, you need a couple of pages to prove that this random walk is uh, almost surely terminating. Uh, what I'm saying is that we as computer scientists, what we try to do is, in terms of program verification, we try to come up with general proof rules that provides sufficient conditions. Remember, it's undecidable, yeah? But you try to give sufficient conditions so that if you can prove your program to satisfy these sufficient conditions, then you can conclude that the program, for instance, terminates. Yeah? And this can be very powerful because here you see this proof is uh, basically free, uh, one line. Yeah? So it can be very powerful. Uh, I try to convince mathematicians of them. They seem to be not so much, uh, well, anyway. <laughs> Um, good, and this you can fully automate. So we worked together with people from the Technical Uni of, uh, University of Vienna in the last couple of years to fully automate this. So really it is the case you put this program into a tool. This tool tells you this program almost surely terminates by just push button technology. 
And this, I hope, shows you a bit what happened over the years from, yeah, let's say, Dijkstra, Hoare, and so on, to West Probabilities. And now I come to the last part, and this makes me feel a little bit more anxious because now I have to talk about something that you are much more expert about than I am. Um, um, what does this mean for quantum programs? Um, so my, my main message of my talk today is that reliability of software is important, reliability of probabilistic programs is important, and reliability of quantum programs is important. I also think that from the computer science point of view, we maybe have something to offer, maybe. So here I have my, a, a very simple probabilistic program. What is this probabilistic program doing? Now C, C, notice C is not initialized, so I don't care what is the initial value. Then you flip a fair coin, either C becomes true, which means you're going to take the next iteration, or C becomes false, and that means this program is going to terminate. Um, this is a geometric, I mean, actually, this is a kind of a geometric distribution. Yeah? The probability that you take K iterations is 1 over 2 to the power K. Good. Now you can look at this quantum program, and uh, this is a kind of a similar doing thing, but now using quantum technology. Okay? So how does it look like? Okay, we have a quantum coin Q. Okay, that's my variable Q in the program. I can measure this qubit, right? And this measurement is conforming this M0 and M1, and these are defined like this. And what, why is this measurement important? Well, I need to check something that when do I terminate, right? But the point, of course, if you measure in quantum, then you lose, I mean, you basically lose information, right? So there you have to be careful. So if the measurement of this quantum coin equals to one, now you enter the body of the loop. What's happening in the body of the loop? You have a Hadamard guard, gate. This Hadamard gate, I guess you know exactly what it does. Yeah? This basically takes Q and you transform Q in uh, this value and basically in its, in its superposition. Yeah? And the claim is that this program is very similar to this uh, probabilistic program over there. I cannot really make this concrete by making a theorem, um, but uh, this quantum program is uh, basically has a kind of similar termination behavior. Yeah, good. Next example. Unless you're any... Make sense? Good. Here's the one-dimensional random walk I showed you before, yeah, which you can prove almost surely terminating uh, by means of uh, tools. So this is the Hadamard walk. So how does this look like? Um, again, uh, you do kind of a, a kind of a measurement. I'm going to explain you in a minute what it does. You check whether it's one. Now you, again, you do apply this Hadamard guard on Q, and then you do a kind of shift operation on Q and P. So the, the, the state space of this program is the tensor product of two Hilbert spaces, right? Um, one which is a natural number, so one is infinite, and the other one I think has uh, two different values. So basically what you get here, you get a quantum coin on the 2D Hilbert space, which is spanned by, let's say, left and right, I call them like this. Uh, we have a variable P, which is this P here, which is basically a natural number in my jargon, so it's based on the infinite uh, Hilbert space defined by, well, you can't read this here, but think about this as the uh, set with natural numbers. Uh, and we have a measurement, and this basically checks whether you reach zero or not. And the shift operation, yeah, you can unfortunately not read this, but the shift operation from the pair R comma N, right? So this is the, uh, uh, the, the let's say, the, the quantum coin, uh, this, this R. This is P. And basically, here you can go one position to the right. This is what this model, and this does one position to the left. Yeah? And this is a, a Hadamard walk. Yeah. Um, so here is the Hadamard walk. Uh, there are two, and of course, uh, for you, they are maybe open doors. For me, as a computer scientist, not. But this is a random walk, and this can move to the left and the right simultaneously. Yeah? This is different from my program that I had before. Yeah, because uh, if you, let's say, go to the right, you basically go to this superposed, uh, let's say, po uh, position. And that means, basically, you go to two positions, in some sense, at the same time. Yeah? There's also another effect. You have quantum inference, that is what's supposed to be written down here. Two parts, so you can have a part that go basically with positive and negative amplitudes, they can cancel each other out. Yeah, this is also possible here. That's not possible in my computer science, let's say, program, but it's possible here. Good, 
um, people have worked to try to similar in the vein of Turing, similar in the way that we at my chair try to prove probabilistic programs. They have tried to develop a framework to verify quantum programs. I'm going to explain you in a minute what the results are. This is this paper, very recent. So they do proof and notations for quantum programs in the way we have seen and the way I showed you. What do they do? They determine the expected runtime. So how long does this quantum program run on expectation? Um, they also give a physical interpretation in terms of a quantum observable, what this expected runtime exactly means. They prove some kind of theorems in the finite dimensional Hilbert space. And they provided a method to compute this expected runtime, again in the finite dimensional Hilbert uh, space, that is numerical and symbolic. And they provided two case studies, one of them I'm going to explain, the other one uh, is a bit too involved. Um, they, they claim that they solved an open problem on quantum walks on a circle of size n. And they proved using this proof, let's say the same, let's say proof strategy of Dijkstra and, 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 uh, and, and Hoare by annotating your program systematically with, uh, with uh, let's say, assertions. They were able to prove uh, that uh, a new result, that is a, a big formula, uh, that tells you uh, what is the expected number of time that a quantum random walk on this circle will take. And they also analyzed the quantum Bernoulli factory, and that's my last example, and then we will stop. So what is a quantum Bernoulli factory? Um, you start with some kind of distribution where you have that the probability that you get hats is P. So you give me, let's say, uh, a, a, a biased coin, you get hats with P and tails with one minus P, and you put this as input into this Bernoulli factory, and what is this Bernoulli factory doing for you? It's going to produce that the a, a new kind of coin, a new kind of distribution, a new kind of sampler, if you want, that is not giving this hats with P, but with F of P, where F is some computable function. Okay? Now, this is a problem that people in um, classical uh, probability theory also use. So this is not a picture for quantum or classical. This is a general picture of a Bernoulli factory. So maybe we look at uh, a classical Bernoulli factory, and this is something that is, let's say, more in my domain. So here is a program. I'm not going through the details of the program, but what you see here is that here is a, a coin flip. The probability half, apparently this variable is doubled, or it's doubled plus one is added. And then there is some calculations going on here. This is from this paper over here. What this does is the following. It takes as input a fair coin. That's the input to your Bernoulli factory. What it does as output, it claims it computes a uniform distribution over n. If it's n is 10, the output that you get 2 is 1 over 10. The probability that you get 9 is 1 over 10. Okay, that's what it does. We try to prove this, and we were able at least for some n to automatically prove this by push-button technology, that uh, the probability that uh, indeed uh, the post condition that you get some output say is a, a, at most 1 over n. Okay, so this is something that uh, yet you can do in terms of, a, of for a classical Bernoulli factory. And people in, 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 let's say, my thing, they call this a discrete sampler. So you, are, you want to sample uh, new distributions from, from existing ones. And this, again, is fully automated. So now let's go to the quantum Bernoulli factory. Now, quantum Bernoulli factories can simulate a strictly larger class of functions. Remember, you go from the probability that hats is P to the probability that hats is F of P. Then the question is, what kind of shape can F have? Now, it's known from the literature that in quantum you can, uh, let's say, strictly larger functions. And this is an example of this function. This function you cannot do with a classical Bernoulli factory. Uh, how does this function look like? This is the, how the function look like, looks like. So basically for P less than a half, so here you see with a half, uh, it's basically two times P. So if you take P is a half, then this is about, well, roughly it should be one, right? 0.2 should be 0.4 and so forth. And after this point, it goes down with the same slope. Yeah, so this is what this part is saying. This thing. You cannot build this by means of a classical Bernoulli factory, but you can do this with a quantum Bernoulli factory. How does this quantum Bernoulli factory look like? It's a program that says Q1 becomes this, Q2 becomes this, in the 
cut notation, right? You take a measurement, as long as this measurement of Q2 equals one, similar as we have seen in the examples before, you execute some body, what is the body doing? Uh, you basically, uh, yeah, I would, in my jargon, I would say it's sample from P, so we take this P, P is the input, right? Input to the Bernoulli factory. Um, and then you do this uh, operation U, which is defined by this uh, uh, matrix, and this gives you the new values of uh, Q1 and Q2. Good. So this is, uh, let's say, a quantum program. And uh, what these people proved is uh, using program verification, right? Um, so using the kind of techniques we use for software reliability, that this program actually generates a quantum, point, uh, quantum coin that has the following. Yeah, you can hardly read this. I think this is 1 minus P over here. Yeah. They also showed that this program terminates with probability 1. And they proved that the expected runtime, if I'm not mistaken, was a constant. And the interesting thing was this is independent of P. That's what this paper proves. Good. This brings me to the last slide. Um, what I try to make clear to you is that software and hardware correctness is pivotal. I was much more focusing on software than on hardware. But uh, software, I try to make, uh, let's say, convince you that state of the art for, for circuits and programs for finite state is model checking. For infinite state is deductive verification. Remember, this is decidable, that is not decidable. That is the main distinction. There are many other distinctions, but that's the main distinction. Um, I showed you that the, there are generalizations toward probabilistic circuits and probabilistic programs. Um, techniques like probabilistic model checking and deductive verification techniques of probabilistic programs. And in my chair, actually, we work at both uh, at the moment quite intensively. Um, and towards quantum, yeah, I think that zero defect quantum software is important, not only at the hardware level. I know that there are tense work to be done also with error correction codes and so on, but I also think the next step is to look at quantum programs and prove, mathematically speaking, that they possess certain properties. And I see, I'm not saying that is my next leap, but there is a leap that goes from, uh, from probabilistic uh, to, to quantum. Good. Here's a website, and uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks for that uh, amazing survey of uh, a whole world of, of uh, computer science that uh, wow. many of us don't know about here, and uh, it seems like we should. I, I'd like to ask about the very last thing. <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, this result about the Bernoulli factory. Now, I, I know that the, the general view in the quantum information right from the beginning is that the relation between quantum and randomness is something very special that you know that that there's a real gold mine yeah. of new things about randomness but i don't think it's been fully mined yet uh so you implied that that uh, this uh, roof function that you mentioned that it is actually known that you cannot produce such yeah. a yeah. classical bernoulli factory yeah. how hard is it to prove that Ooh. is that a very complex proof um <clears throat> I looked at some of the uh, the proofs this weekend, and they looked to me quite uh, quite uh, deep. Yeah, okay. it's not that easy. But it's in yeah. the domain of computer science, where it's been no, I, it's in the domain of quantum. I think that people oh, prove oh, the this. quantum people took yeah. the trouble yeah. of proving that yeah. it can't be done classically. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, to uh -huh. make sure to make sure that uh, to claim really sure that they have uh, something. Yeah, well, to claim that uh, quantum and only factories are indeed strictly more expressive, so you can do more with these kind of things. Okay. Yeah. Do you think there's a significant body of such results uh, already in classical computer science? You know, cl classifying F of P's that cannot be implemented, or is this sort of a special purpose uh, situation? <clears throat> um, that's a good question that I find, find very hard to answer, actually, honestly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think I think definitely uh, for computer scientists it would be very very interesting to understand. I mean, what you can do with quantum computers, what you cannot do with classical computers, or what can you do more efficiently, or maybe also more reliably with quantum versus <coughs> classical, or maybe the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, to make this distinction more clear is definitely something that is of interest. Yeah. 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 Okay. So just to say, we're we're getting we're approaching uh, 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 Oktoberfest table time, but not yet, not yet. So we uh, we definitely uh, want to have full time for any discussion. So there's a question here. Just one question, maybe. I also just did not get it. So is because I'm asking in the sense of like unit testing. Is then deductive model checking or my code is it similar to unit testing or is this like a separate pair which has That's nothing to do because there no. are also <laughs> assertions and. 
check if it's doing what I'm <laughs> expecting it is doing. Yeah, but uh, in, in, in testing, typically you are biased in, in, on, on specific tests, right? Mm -hmm. You test specific inputs. Yeah? In, in, in deductive verification, you try to make statements that are hold for all possible inputs. Okay, so it's like, yeah? it's a general form, Yes. So okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, with model checking also, you don't, you, I mean, you could test a hardware circuit, of course. And people do this, right? And there are good reasons to do this because testing is also a complementary technique to model checking. You only check the model, you don't check the real circuit. So if you build on the circuit, you definitely shouldn't do testing to show that your circuit is also performing as you expect it to be. Yeah. But the point is really that you try to make statements about all possible scenarios, all possible inputs. Yeah. So. I, of course, I have even another question, but uh, let me ask it, and then I'll we'll get to uh, to Reiner. So you uh, you introduced to me the notion of semi uh, undecidability or semi decidability, which is fascinating. That so you say that uh, there are you explain there are certain classes of uh, programs that where you can just you know you give it to your automated thing and it says it will halt. Um, but you of course but you say that of course you can give it programs where it just says I don't know. And I guess my question is, are those still very short programs, or do you have to find very Oh, no, they can be very short, yeah. So, okay, so it's easy to yeah. baffle your, yeah. uh, your yeah. halter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, Reiner Walser. Um, yeah. <laughs> Certainly, I won't uh, ask anything about your algorithms and so on, because many parts of this, I must admit, I didn't understand. It looks uh, nice. It looks uh, certainly plausible somehow, but... Okay, uh, what I wanted to ask, um, you have shown uh, the, the number, how many dollars or euros are lost per year due to software failures. Uh, and can you tell me what is the national gross product of uh, the United States and what is a fraction of this? Oh, I don't know. To the, no, I don't know. I have to dig it up. But you yeah. I don't know. I found this, this number are very, very in but impressive. This uh, number looks so huge yeah. that you should really find out. I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's very easy. Just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I didn't find. Didn't look it up. But that's a good point. or Google yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim Henry. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, nice talk. I have a question. Maybe I misunderstood this, but. Um, uh, is this on this last slide of yours you showed that you have to kind of measure a quantum state and then you go into this while loop uh, yep. uh, right yeah so would you have to reset the quantum state after each uh, cycle of the while loop no. or no no it was already in the in the very first example where i used this right uh, i mean i think it was this this example uh, here i use already the same principle right I mean, here you do a measurement, yeah? And then after the measurement, you, you apply this Hadamard gate to Q, and then you get the new value of Q. And then you repeat, you do the measurement again, you apply it. So the way to read this is really like this, right? You check the guard, if this guard is true, then you're going to execute the body, and then you uh, apply the Hadamard gate to your input. And you do this as long as, yeah, at some point your measurement says, yeah, it's not going to be equal to one and then the program is terminating. Yep. Okay, any, uh, any further thoughts? And of course, then I should ask, is there anything in the chat uh, is the uh, thing you always ask. Okay, not, uh, not for the time being, okay. Um, well, I think we slowly uh, come to an end. We have a few uh, closing activities because we're at the end of our ULIC Summer Academy, but uh, I'd like to thank Joost Peter again for a lovely uh, lecture. <clears throat> Okay, so, so we're going to have a short survey, but maybe we'll begin with a little uh, relaxing video, okay? <laughs>
Academy in pictures, I guess next year we have to say, uh, learn how to do software verification. Um, now, uh, I've, I'm asked to do, just do a few other things to close us off. Um, so uh, that is the end of the video, right? Um, so we have a, a little uh, survey. Um, how do we do it, actually? Some telephone thingy? I'm just seeing. You're, you're about to tell me how it works. Oh, okay. So that just means recipi uh, registered members will get a, a survey, and if you could please um, uh, fill it in, we'll get a better idea of how you've enjoyed the uh, Summer Academy. Um, I think with that, we're really done. Um, I'm, I'm looking for signals from the communications department. Uh, I, I don't understand your sand signals. The one five is like some computer code here. Uh, just, just speak up. You know, we. Oh, there's a slide. Okay. Oh, there's a slide that says. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, yes. Well, that's just saying. I, I think this is not uh, necessary for. I'll say most of you that uh, you know that you're uh, you're here. Uh, most of you are employed by uh, the Forschungszentrum, and you uh, know we are a great employer. But if you have friends who would like to be employed here, you can uh, learn more about it from from these uh, sites and from these people. I don't know if I, there's anything more about this that uh, you'd like me to say. Okay. That's that's it. Um, so I, you know, there's something that happens always at the end of the Olympics. I declare the this the Olympiad, uh, the Summer Academy 2023 closed, and that's it. <laughs>